Hooking was a legitimate profession in the Roman Empire. Sex workers in ancient Rome had to register with the local authorities giving their name, age and even their price. They'd then be issued a license. The modern saying, once a hoe, always a hoe, was actually true back then, as your record as a sex worker was not rescindable. You were a hoe for life, if not by profession, then at least by stigma and as a matter of historical record. My name is Scylla. And I'm a whore. Everybody's heard of me. <laughs> but not only did you have to register with the authorities, by law you had to be blonde. That's right, a special hair color was required in order to be a sex worker. Does this mean that our modern idea of the sexual promiscuity or easiness of blondes is actually not so modern at all, but instead traces its antecedents from ancient Rome? Who knows, but it's very possible. Then, as now, most sex work was not considered an upper-class activity. In fact, a lot of sex workers in Rome were from the barbarian world. Many hailed from Northern Europe and were victims of war. Since the Gauls and Germanic peoples to the north were blonde compared to the Romans, having blonde hair was synonymous with being inferior. And seeing as sex workers were, regardless of actual origins, beneath a proper Roman woman, they were forced to be blonde, to mark themselves as barbarians for all to see. Those who weren't natural blondes bleached it. Others wore wigs made from the hair of German or Scandinavian women. This practice lasted for centuries and thus naturally led to a rather ingrained stigma surrounding blonde women. Golden hair that Gala wears is hers. Who would have thought it? She swears it's hers. And true she swears, for I know where she bought it. <laughs> As is the case with fads and fashion in today's world, what is once shunned by the masses can become a popular fashion statement if a celebrity gets in on the act. And that is indeed how being blonde at one stage suddenly became cooler than the breasts of Venus. Whether malicious rumors created to damage her reputation politically or true tales of vice and lust, the story of Emperor Claudius's third wife, Valeria Messalina, is an entertaining one. According to Pliny the Elder, a near contemporary historian of the Empress and a poet, Valeria, the great granddaughter of Mark Antony, had a voracious sexual appetite, which she satisfied by sporting a blonde wig, taking on the fictional name She Wolf, and prowling the city for what one historian has described as brutal sex with strangers. Rumors also circulated that she often worked for fun and undercover at the city's many brothels. Obviously, not content with being the most powerful woman in Rome, on one infamous occasion, she reportedly challenged a great prostitute to a sex duel. President of the Guild of Prostitutes! <laughs> Allow me to introduce you to the Lady Messalina, your challenger and the Emperor's wife. This is Scylla the Sicilian and anybody's wife. <laughs> I am honored. For a period of 24 hours, they worked side by side in a brothel where Valeria eventually won the competition for most banks after racking up a tally of 25 clients. Let us begin. Which side of the bed do you prefer? Left or right? Lady, give me a support for my back and let the games begin, as they say. <laughs> Such exploits, or more likely the tales of them, whether true or not, turned her into immorality incarnate for centuries after her death but the reaction to her sporting the blonde hair of prostitutes was quite the opposite. According to one source, the women of Rome soon started imitating her style by also sporting blonde hair. Being blonde became associated with trendiness rather than prostitution and being a barbarian. Apart from being forced by law to be blonde, female women of the night also wore a toga. Lady, I'm a professional. I work for money. The honor I gladly leave to you. <laughs> <laughs> what impudence! She expects to be paid, and in this company. A garment usually preserved for men. Some ancient texts also describe them as being naked like slaves, without the right to privacy or ownership of themselves. The Roman writer Senesa once wrote of a prostitute for stale. Naked she stood on the shore, at the pleasure of the purchaser. Every part of her body was examined and felt. Would you hear the result of the sale? The pirate sold, the pimp bought, that he might employ her as a prostitute. The boundaries between slavery and prostitution were likely highly blurred, as the former was considered property under Roman law, and hence why not rent out your property for a fee whilst not using it yourself? Sex work was also deployed as punishment. At one stage a law was passed which stated 
women guilty of adultery could even be sentenced to forced prostitution in a brothel. So what were the Roman brothels where these blonde barbarians plied their trade like, apart from contemporary works of history, poems and other literature which have survived to our day, a lot of what we know of the sexual ethos and brothels of the Romans stem from the city of Pompeii. Join me in part two to see what they were like then and today as I travel to Pompeii. The emperor's wife is competing with a prostitute to see who can wear out the most men. Oh, they've been at it since noon. Where?